Hey guys, today we're going to talk about the five laws of gold, or the five rules of gold, from the book The Richest Man in Babylon. This is one of my favorite books, I recommend it all the time, and I get asked about it all the time. And I'm not a rich guy, but I used to not have enough to pay my bills, and now I have more than enough, which is I think the main goal for most people. Now, there is more to the story, and I recommend the book and the audiobook, which I did post on my channel by the way, but what we'll cover here today is the main thing to know about this. And we'll visualize this with one income and with multiple incomes. And by the way, this doesn't matter what your income is. This applies to all incomes of any size, whether you just have a job or you have your own business or you have multiple incomes. This is still the exact same formula. Hopefully you guys can see this. Now, the first rule of gold is to pay yourself first. That's the modern translation of it. But this rule is going to appear in all types of different books that you read on finance and personal development. This is straight out of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The Wealthy Barber, The Automatic Millionaire, a whole bunch of books that cover pay yourself first. It's basically the most important discipline to master. And The Richest Man in Babylon puts this as more like a law of the universe, like money will not come to those who cannot discipline themselves with it in the very minimal way at least of diverting 10%, at least 10% of your income towards what? Towards investment. But the key word here for this type of investment, and we'll go into different types of incomes and investments in another video, but for this type of investment, it's a passive investment. And this type of investment doesn't require extra work from you. It only requires the investment itself. That's what makes it a passive investment. If you're gonna do any other type of investment, you do that with your 90% of your income. And by the way, this sets a definition down here. If you cannot afford to live on 90% or less of what you make, you either don't make enough or your bills are too high. Again, in another video, we'll cover the seven cures for a lean purse, which is also out of this book, because that's most people's two main problems with their finances. Number one, they don't divert 10%. They don't pay themselves 10% first for investment. And number two, they don't make enough money, right? Or they spend too much, some combination of those problems. But this is basically rule number one. As long as you've done that, you've got, you've got this money, you don't have to invest it yet. As long as you've diverted 10% of every single dollar that comes to you, whether you find it on the street, whether you work for it, whether you inherit it, whether you make some extra money at a garage sale on the weekend, it does not matter. 10% of every single dollar that comes to you goes into a pile for passive investment. That's law number one. Law number two picks right up after this. Invest the 10% wisely, basically. And this is going to apply to pretty much all the other rules as well. Now, in The Richest Man in Babylon, they talk about this rule number two, basically as putting your money to work for you. You're sending this saved 10%, you're sending that out to work, right? So that it can produce more for you. Okay, now this is key because everything that's gonna pick up off of here, including any multiple incomes, this investment is going to produce a profit. And the total amount that you make or whatever, that's going to be called your gross, right? Your gross income. That's before expenses and all that. What you take home is your net. But this is going to contribute to your gross, what? Your gross income, right? So this profit here is also, it goes back up into your income. That's, this is the key. This is one of the keys. You could fall off of this whole thing. If you invest 10% of your money, it makes money. And then you waste that money, right? This is also where you get the magic of compound interest. Compound interest, something is left in an account and it's gaining, but then those gains are staying in the account and now you're still making percentages off of a new, bigger total. This is how compound interest can create really big numbers because it's staying in the account and it's recycling itself. But if you take that money out, you have to treat that as income. And by the way, what I would consider is that the principal doesn't count. If you put $1,000 in and it makes $10, you only made $10. The $10 is part of your income. $1 of that gets thrown right back into the passive investment fund. And this could be multiple things. You could have money in silver. You could have it in RRSPs, GICs, high interest savings account, tax-free savings account, anything but cash, basically. Anything that's going to appreciate without your effort could potentially consider that a house as well. As long as it's, you got a good deal on it, it's probably going to go up in the future, that kind of thing can be considered a passive investment. A flip is not a passive investment. That's a business, you have to put work into it. It's also a risk. So we've got the first two laws here. And the third one also has to do with this investment. Basically, a lot of the rest of the, the whole book is concerned with how you actually invest the money, who you take advice from, 
And rule number three is consult experts before investing. Consult with people who are in the industry that you're looking at investing in. Consult with people who have RRSPs and GICs. Consult with a financial analyzer or financial manager. You, they'll probably meet with you for free. They'll probably give you a free consultation to meet with them. You might as well get opinions on where you're going to actually put your money. The Richest Man in Babylon goes into particular detail on counseling rich people. Counsel people who have money, people who are used to money, people who are used to investing money, right? Speak to people who have at least as much money as you, but probably more and significantly more. They're going to have good advice on what to do with it in terms of passive investment. So consult with your experts. That's law number three. Number four is related to this. Invest in what you know. It's one thing to take the advice of experts. It's another thing to follow them blindly. And if you are going to invest in something you don't know, make sure that you're not too invested in it. For example, I'm invested in crypto because I did consult with people that I know who make more money than me, people who are involved in the crypto market and have been involved for a while and have retrieved profits from that system and who know about it. Consulted a lot with them, read eBooks, all that kind of stuff. I still don't think I really got it, but I think I've done my due diligence in consulting with the experts on it. And since I don't necessarily have full confidence in cryptocurrency, I'm not too leveraged in it. I don't have that much money in it. There's enough where it's considered part of my passive investment portfolio, but it's not enough where it would break me if crypto disappeared tomorrow. And law number five, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And again, that's the modern translation of it, but the book puts it more like you don't want to ask too much of your money, of your investment. If you're seeking too much of your investment, it probably is not going to work or it's probably too good to be true. Right, a good annual compound interest investment in something like an RRSP or an index fund of a market like the NASDAQ, a great return is somewhere around 5% a year. And that doesn't sound like very much to someone who's like, well, I wanna make money, right? Well, passive investment is really not supposed to make you that much money. It's not how the world works. If somebody's telling you that it's going to gain 25%, 50%, 200%, it's probably too good to be true. And this can sound too skeptical when, of course, a lot of people just made a lot of money on uh, crypto, Bitcoin, GameStop, stuff like this, where, yeah, you really have to take a risk to, to be in on that. Honestly, to me, I would consider anything with a high risk, anything over, say, 10%, and that's pushing it, probably anything over 5% annual return, I wouldn't invest this. I would do that with what's left over from the 90%, right? But remember with this, because we've covered the five laws of gold now, but obviously this only really tells you what to do with 10% of your money. It's funny that the five laws of gold don't really care what you do with the other 90% of your money, right? But it does talk about it, it does go into it. They're just separate from the goal of accumulating wealth. If you want to accumulate wealth, the 90% is nowhere near as important as that 10%. And I hope we've clarified really the key here. The key is that these investments make money and that the product of that investment, the profit, has to be also considered income, reinvested. So this is where pay yourself first comes from. You're paying yourself that 10% before anything else is paid, before groceries are bought, before employees are paid, before you buy your wife a gift, anything. 10% is first. For me, it's reflexive. Every single morning I check the bank statement, whatever just got put in the account, I'm taking 10% immediately, regardless of what my expenses are, regardless of what my debts are at that moment. It sounds crazy to some people, but that's what this 90% is about. You paid yourself first, and then next you can pay your bills. And that's gonna be included your, your food bills and stuff like that. You can't starve, or none of this is it has a point if you starve, because the next thing is your debt, right? You're gonna have debt and the idea is not to have debt, but you, you gotta pay it off aggressively. It's gonna be good advice. Pay the debt off aggressively, but obviously you've eaten first at this point. You've already paid yourself first, you're already invested. This is your future, you're paying your future. You've already done that. Right? So you're taking care of your future self first. Now you're taking care of yourself right now with your bills. And then of course you take care of everybody else with your debts. You want to pay your debts, you wanna pay them aggressively, but this stuff has to be done first. And again, if you're not making enough to do this, you need to make more money or you need to cut down your bills, but that doesn't change this 10%. Nothing changes the 10%. It doesn't matter if you're broke, doesn't matter if you're rich, you have to divert some of it for a passive investment. 
If you are playing this money game and you're doing reasonably well, to me, all that means is you can pay your bills and there is money for a little bit of extra stuff. That's fantastic. A lot of people now will be asking about active investments, right? Things that they could put money into to make more than 5% a year, basically. This could be business investments. I consider anything that helps my business, that's gonna be after this. After the, the bills are paid and any debts I owe have been equally paid, right? Maybe I owe $1,000 and I only have $200. If I owe that to two people, 500 each, whatever, it doesn't really matter, I'll pay them $100 each. Trying to get rid of the debts as fast as possible to anybody, that's whether it's credit card or a mortgage or something, get rid of that debt as much as possible. And if there is anything left over, you can do more investments. Again, things like flipping, you're buying something that you're going to have to put effort into reselling, even if it's a good profit, it's still a business, so it's not a passive investment. And guys, that's pretty much it. Like, honestly, we could go into the cures for a lean purse right now, but you know, I like that this is a nice short video. People think that this is more complicated than it is. It really is not. There is a lot that we could talk about in terms of having new incomes, right? Having multiple incomes. Remember this little guy here, this is, I considered this one income, but it wouldn't matter. You could have five incomes. You know, I have multiple incomes. Some of them are really small. I get paid one penny per listen on my podcast. You know, it's a, it's a tiny little income. It doesn't matter. It goes into the main division here. It, it gets diverted 10% at least into investments. And then the rest just goes into my life, you know, running my life and uh, you know, whatever types of business ventures that I want to get into to add into this. But really that that's all that the formula for wealth is at its core, diverting your money paying yourself at least 10%, could be more once you make more money, could be more than 10%, divert that into a passive investment, make sure to consult with the correct experts who are involved in that field before you invest in it, make sure to do your own homework as well. And if somebody's promising amazing returns, really you wanna question that, it probably is too good to be true. Has this person done this type of investment before? Are they dragging you into something that is uncharted territory for both of you? How much money do you have to put down to be involved in this venture? Are there other people who have benefited from this venture that's being proposed to you? Can you talk to them first? I don't like to be involved in that many different things. I don't like to be involved in things I don't know about. So doing this type of due diligence is really highly recommended. That way you can sleep safe and you don't have to worry whether all your money is going to disappear. And of course you put it into things that are smart because other people who make money are doing the same thing. And if any one of those pillars crash, it's not going to kill you because you have a diverse investment portfolio is what they would call it. You have your money in different places. So that is the gist of this video. I do highly recommend the book, The Richest Man in Babylon. I cannot tell you how many times I've listened to this and read this, especially in my poorest years. Once I had gained the motivation to do something to change my financial life, I needed this drilled into me before I would finally follow it. And it finally worked. It really did work. I don't owe any money on my house and my car. You know, to have extra money at the end of the month. I never even envisioned I'd truly be in this situation. And I credit so much of that to this book. Highly recommend it. Again, you can find the audiobook version of this on my channel. And I also have this book, which I have never plugged here on this channel. But I wrote this about my financial journey and how I applied these rules to my life. I basically spent most of my adult life very poor. So I was able to get out of that. I highly recommend that. And there's an extended version of this book, which has also The Richest Man in Babylon in it includes The Richest Man in Babylon in this book, which makes it a really good value. Amazon Canada and Japan, you can buy it right off of Amazon. I know it's kind of complicated. The rest of you guys can buy this off of my website, noticebooks.org at the same price, or you can get the shorter version, which costs less. You'll see it, it's the same book. It just doesn't include The Richest Man in Babylon. And the video read along and audiobook versions are both free. You can find them both on my website, noticebooks.org. And for today, guys, that's it. I appreciate you until next time. And make sure to check out my channel for many other videos on a whole array of subjects. And my other channels are all in the description of this video. If you didn't know, I do have a lot of reviews on my Instagram, at Ryan Alexander, and my website, noticebooks.org. I'm very excited to announce my newest book, Everything the Government Does is Bad for Us. And you can get the paperback on Amazon for just $9.99. And you can find the video read-along version or the audiobook on my website, noticebooks.org. Hey guys, make sure to check out my website, noticeart.com. We've got a whole bunch of t-shirts, a ton of designs on them, a whole bunch of printed canvases, printed posters. I've got real paintings, real mixed media art. And of course, there's going to be many more designs and paintings and all of that on the site in the future. <laughs>